Hi, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be joining virtually this uh, conference on collective intelligence to talk to you about experts versus ordinary citizens in the French Convention on Climate Change. So in the uh, fall of 2019, last year, the French government convened an assembly of 150 randomly selected citizens to um, debate and deliberate about uh, ways to reduce French green gas emissions by 40% of the 1990s levels in a spirit of social justice. The convention was convened for six weekends that turned into seven by the end of the process. Um, this convention survived massive social protests and a pandemic and we'll gather physically for the last time this coming uh, weekend, on June 19th to June 21st, to render its conclusions and proposals to the government. Obviously, uh, how to reduce green gas emissions in a spirit of social justice is a very difficult question, rendered in this particular case all the more technical by the fact that President Macron made it clear he wanted the citizens to deliver low lag proposals that he could submit I quote, without filter, in his own words, to a referendum, direct regulation, or parliamentary debate. This meant that, in effect, the ordinary citizens were asked to be competent not only in the substance, a very complicated topic of climate change, uh, but also on the best way to translate and transcribe their ideas into a legalistic format. Obviously, ordinary citizens cannot do that on their own, and they need experts' help. Unlike the great national debate, which was a free-for-all kind of nationwide, nationwide conversation about four general topics, the Convention on Climate Change uh, involved a lot of experts uh, in a way that went beyond the cases I'm aware of. For example, we know Jane Fishkin's uh, deliberative polls include experts, but include them as um, outside speakers uh, intervening on, on panels at, as, at a distance from the, the members of the deliberative polls. Similarly, in the Irish case uh, of the 2016 um, Citizens Assembly on Abortion, uh, the experts came in as uh, outside um, uh, speakers without mingling with the participants to the degree that they did in the French Convention. So the question for us today is this, can ordinary citizens avail themselves of experts' help and work with them as closely as they did in the French uh, Convention on Climate Change without surrendering sovereignty over the laws to experts, and in fact, without uh, being captured by them? It's a constant worry uh, and a constant critic of this kind of setup that there's a danger that the clueless citizens are going to be captured by uh, more informed parties. In other words, can the collective intelligence of citizens be augmented with experts' knowledge, as it needs to on technical issues, without the experts taking over entirely? I think there are some lessons that we can derive from the French Convention on Climate Change in that respect. The good news is that uh, ordinary citizens can be lawmakers, uh, after all, not just agenda setters when they are properly helped with experts. That came to me as a surprise because in my own uh, you know, previous research, research, I had envisioned a role for ordinary citizens that was that of generalist agenda setters, not uh, actual legislators. And this Convention on Climate Change has convinced me that actually, with the proper help, they can become very, very close to actual le uh, legislators. The bad news is that uh, it's very hard, time-consuming, painstaking, uh, at times aggravating to work out a functional relationship between citizens that keeps, uh, between citizens and experts that keep each of these uh, categories in their proper place. Uh, and for me, that would be citizens on top and experts on top. Why do citizens need to stay on top, you might ask? We could imagine a different um, setup where actually the experts are the decision makers and they consult ordinary citizens. I think citizens need to remain on top because as the theory of collective intelligence predicts and the practice in that case, in the case of the French Convention, completely verified, the diversity of thinking present in the group of citizens plays an essential role in reopening the conceptual boxes 
constantly closed by the experts. Citizens' presence prevents the closure of the conversation to areas that the experts are familiar with. Um, to use a topographic metaphor, citizens will keep wandering in all kinds of directions, allowing them to explore the solution um, map uh, outside the perimeter narrowly defined by experts. In that way, the group will cover a lot more of the possible landscape than they would if they just uh, search for solutions where experts are used to looking for them. And this collective intelligence phenomenon can only happen if citizens are positioned as the drivers of the deliberation and the ultimate, decisions make, ultimate decision makers, and if um, experts are subordinated to them and at, the, at their service. So let me now illustrate this with a um, couple of examples from the Citizens' Convention on Climate Change. But first, let me define what I mean by an expert. So I define experts as individuals identified as bearers of a certain type of knowledge and expertise through their credentials, reputations, um, and uh, they are selected as experts to intervene in the convention. By contrast, the citizens are non-experts in the sense that they were chosen on a random basis rather than on the basis of whatever knowledge or expertise they, they may also happen to have. So the experts in, in this sense um, were present among at least uh, four groups in the convention. So it was extremely present throughout the, the, the process. First, they were heavily present on the governance committee of the 150 ordinary citizens. Um, this governance committee included, for example, three climate change experts, three citizen participation experts, and various people from the third legislative uh, chamber in France who have some expertise in social and economic uh, topics. The second group of experts uh, included the organizers themselves, meaning the uh, agencies, uh, Mission Publique and Res Publica, that run a very tight show of uh, plenaries, uh, working groups, uh, speed dating sessions with uh, various uh, speakers, and online webinars over months uh, on the basis of their prudential knowledge and their practice of, of deliberative assembly. The third group of experts was the so-called support group, uh, which included academics and government experts, put at the service of the citizens, and they were there to answer technical questions, to evaluate the carbon impact of the proposed measures, to provide facts and, um, and resources of all kinds. The fourth group, finally, included uh, the so-called legalistic committee, uh, and that was a group of uh, high-level civil servants in charge of transcribing and translating citizen proposals into official legalese. So all these experts played an enormous role throughout the process. From the beginning, citizens' interactions were, as I said, governed by uh, this group of 15 people at the top. It was micromanaged on the ground by the organizers on, on a very tight schedule. And the citizens were constantly and heavily lectured at and advised by all kinds of experts. And even with such a, a sort of very um, expert heavy uh, setup, um, I noticed a change of gear towards the, 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 the fourth session, between the fourth and fifth sessions, where in fact um, experts gain even more um, power in the convention, if you will. They started introducing a level of detail in the text that had been absent so far, down to, for example, the ideal temperature at which washing machines should operate. And this was not necessarily something that the citizens themselves had come up with. Nonetheless, throughout, I also observed a constant pushback from the citizens and a constant and, in fact, growing assertion of sovereignty over the text um, and the ideas in the text. So let me show you now um, how citizens main virtue, main contribution to collective intelligence in a way is to reopen the boxes constantly closed by the experts. So the first example is from the first session of the convention in uh, October. During a meeting between five members of the legalistic committee and the, and the, 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 the 150 citizens convened in, an, in, an, in a plenary. One of the uh, members of the legalistic committee, a state councillor, presented a long Pictureless PowerPoint on the hierarchy of norms in French law. It was very technical and frankly a little a little boring. 
uh, which was confirmed the following day uh, on the mood boards where people complain that there's too much expert talk, uh, that the experts speak too fast, that the legal presentation in particular was, uh, was very difficult. Yet to my surprise, when question time came for the, for the, for the state councillor, the first question was this one. In the table of the hierarchy of norms, you did not note the place of contract. Why is that? I was blown away by the specificity of, uh, of the question and uh, wondered how the state councillor was going to, to handle it. So here's how the state councillor replied. And I want you to notice the, the mid-sentence reversal um, uh, and, and the, the, the move from a position of, uh, of uh, uh, confident lecturing to a moment of self-doubt and, and a concession that the citizen was actually right. So here's the, the, the state councillor's answer. I quote, it was to enlighten you on what you are going to propose. A priori, you are not going to propose contracts. There are two types of contracts, private contracts and public contracts, but it's not in what you are a priori. Well, that said, yes, that's an excellent idea. Contracts are also part of what you could propose. Contracts between private persons on certain matters, you are right. Don't bridle yourselves, you are right. So, um, we see a 100 degree reversal in the expert's position prompted by a single question from an innocent uh, sounding naive uh, uh, citizen. And it opened up a new field of, 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 uh, of action for, for the group. A second example came in, se in session four, um, just after the uh, visit, uh, the official visit by President Macron. So this was in a, in a subgroup, in a, a working group uh, focused on housing, the one that I have been following for the last few months, where an expert started lecturing the citizens about the lack of concern for the ways to finance the proposed measures. So she clearly moved from a position of uh, advice to a position of uh, admonishing and, and passing normative judgments on, on what the citizens were doing. So I think um, the fact that she, this expert crossed the line here was actually um, instantly picked on by, by, um, by the citizens. So here's what she said to the citizens. You are calling for a lot of expenses. If your convention makes the French deficit go up to 10% of the GDP, the president will say, no, I can't sink France. And to this, the citizens reacted very uh, strongly. So one of them immediately said, quite aggressively actually, I can't believe this, it's your interpretation. Leave the president alone. Who is this lady? Why doesn't she introduce herself? For whom is she working? So there was immediately a suspicion that she was um, a kind of um, lobbyist uh, or that it wasn't clear what her motivations were. She lost credibility in that instance. Uh, another citizens <clears throat> immediately chimed in as well, less aggressively. I quote, I understand we should pay attention to funding, but to focus on, what, on that now is a little too quick. We are going to think about it. We will find solutions. Don't hurry us. So again, what you saw here is uh, an expert closing a box too soon. Um, in fact, as demonstrated a few months later by the fact that now the deficit constraints uh, has been thrown out of uh, the window for the pandemic. But not, not only that, it's also that the, the box was closed with a sort of normative um, judgment on top of it that was not uh, seen as legitimate by the citizens. Third example uh, happened very recently during a mandatory webinar that took place on, on May 31st. That for me is in a way the, the most crucial example. So the citizens were gathered uh, by the organizers virtually because uh, they, 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 there was no possibility to, to meet physically at that point in time to, to debate the possibility of a referendum on some of their proposals. Um, that could legally lend themselves to such a treatment. So the organizers presented a PowerPoint spelling out the options on the basis of what the legalistic committee had recommended, but the, the legalistic committee was absent. So the organizers was presenting their suggestions. So the possibility of a, a multi-question referendum comes up in the Zoom chat uh, when a citizen asks, again, a seemingly naive question, a multiple choice referendum has never been organized in France. Does it have more chances to be accepted? And the organizer answers that since it has never been organized, the legalistic committee chose not to put this option on the menu because it seemed to them relatively uncertain. 
So it's a very, very clear-cut example. And in fact, even a shocking example of experts unduly narrowing the perimeter of the possible um, on something that could be uh, the life or spell out the, the life or death of some, some proposals. Because personally, I think that um, a multiple choice uh, referendum is kind of the only way for some of the measures to be accepted. Because in France, we have a sort of tradition, and many countries also do, of um, uh, approaching referenda as, as, a, as a plebiscite on government. And if you have only one question, that's how citizens are going to use that. So what's, what was striking to me is that the organizer statement went almost unnoticed for a while until one of the impartial guarantors who are uh, there to observe and make sure everything goes well and without ethical uh, breaches intervened and said, uh, when you say, he said to the organizers, when you say that the legalistic committee sidelined the possibility of a multiple choice referendum, it does not mean that it's not technically possible. It seems to me that it's up to the citizens to decide this, not up to the legalistic committee. To which the organizer uh, answered a bit defensively that, well, I did not say they sidelined it. I just said that they chose not to in instruct this hypothesis, uh, which is another way to say that they sidelined it, basically. So, um, and the guarantor again insisted, it is important to keep this an open hypothesis and it's up to citizens to decide. So notice that the citizens did reopen that box, right? Somebody put it on the chat and reopened that box. But you see how fragile this reopening can be if experts have too much power. And that's why the presence of the impartial guarantor who picked up on that suggestion and made sure it was on the table um, and reopened the box uh, helped really strengthen that, that power of the citizens. So there's a lot more I could say uh, about expert citizens' relationship in this convention, which is fascinating in all kinds of ways. Uh, but the main message for my purposes today is this. Citizens can be lawmakers, but they can only be so uh, with the help of um, experts, the heavy involvement of experts. There's no doubt about that. So it is crucial for the collective intelligence of the outputs and the qualities of the laws ultimately generated that the citizens remain on top of experts and remain and, and experts in turn remain at the service of citizens on tap. The strength of the citizen is to force experts to think out of the box and they can only do that if they are actually empowered to do so, so both by the design of the convention and by the presence of uh, strategic agents that support their views like uh, the guarantors. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mr. Zuckerman Sivan, and I am very happy to be with you today to share just a few sociological ruminations uh, that I've sort of uh, labeled de de-densifying collective intelligence. What do I mean by that? So, why am I here? <laughs> I think I'm here for um, one major reason, which is that uh, Christoph Riedel, thank you for inviting me, saw a Twitter thread of mine. And so I'm gonna get to that Twitter thread. Um, the other part to think about is that uh, I'm not sure exactly why I'm here. I've never been, uh, I don't know you folks that well on CIC. I've heard about it over the years, especially from my colleague, Tom Malone. And so it's a little bit unclear uh, how do we approach an audience that I don't know and then on Zoom and all that. So I thought I'd do is just um, think through, if someone, you know, going back to a little bit saying who I am, um, you know, imagine sort of the beginning of my career, and there's a little bit of it. Someone had asked me what co collective intelligence was, what made for more or less collective intelligence, what might I have said, and then how my thinking might have changed over the years. So that's what I'll do. Um, I think my answer would have been, at the beginning of my career, if you would just ask me without allowing me to think very much, is I would have told you, okay, it's about a dense network. The denser the connections among the nodes, the people in the population, the more efficient the spread of the ideas, and therefore, more intelligent. After a little more thought, I think I would have come up with two caveats. This is sort of caveat 1A and caveat 1B. One caveat would have been, like, what do you mean by collectivity anyway? You can't just, I learned from Karl Marx, you can't just assume that all because, say, instead of nodes, or you put them together, even if they have the same interests, even if they occupy the same role, 
does that mean that they actually have class consciousness, they have collective consciousness, that they'll act for themselves? Does it mean um, that they'll be able to coordinate with each other? Not necessarily. We've got to think of that as being contingent. When does that happen when it doesn't happen? The second caveat I think I would add would have to do with, well, how are you even, before we get to, to collective consciousness, how are you deciding who's in that population of interest, those nodes? How are you specifying the boundaries? This is something that I learned a lot from I'm highlighting here a paper by my former advisor, Ed Lauman and colleagues. That's a really tough problem when you think about it. Um, mostly what we have is heuristics for solving that problem, not like a clear rationale often. A second caveat might come from thinking about work that I was already doing, continue to do, based on work of my other advisor, Ronald Burt, very influential book called Structural Holes. This is an image from it. Uh, he made a distinction building on Mark Granovetter, anticipating somewhat some other work. They were working on bridges. Somewhat, you could think of this as, as small worlds being connected by um, a shortcut, a bridge. In this case, Robert seemingly has, at the individual level, some advantages in the fact that he bridges to multiple clusters. They could have um, new ideas in each of those clusters that he's connecting um, and um, making the whole system perhaps more intelligent. Uh, in work that uh, Ray Reagans and I did together, really actually just following out the logic of structural holes theory and reworking it a bit, what we, we can show is that that logic does hold, um, but it's a little tricky. And in particular, uh, there's sort of a risk return aspect to um, structural holes. Uh, in the sense that uh, before you build a bridge to a new cluster, a new world, a new neighborhood, you don't know what you're going to find. You don't know whether there's actually new information there. You don't know whether if it's information that, that might, someone else might need or not, such that there might be gains from trade. And so there's risk associated with it. Uh, so the more clusters you bridge, the more potential return, um, but you also take much more risk. Um, and so as we build up towards thinking about collective intelligence. On the one end, you might think, well, we don't actually need a fully dense network. Um, you all you need is bridges. But on the other hand, bridges can be risky. Okay. What I want to do is um, say a few things about my work over the years since then, and how they might speak to conversations about collective intelligence. So one thing I'll, I'll highlight, I'll advertise a little bit, is some work I, I did with Stoyan Sigurev, a former student of mine. Um, we made a discovery. Uh, a, an institution that had really gone unnoticed in the American economy. It's, it's pretty prevalent. We did some work showing that. Um, and we think it's prevalent in capitalist economies throughout the world. It's something we call the industry peer network. And there are a lot of related institutions that what they do is um, they facilitate the building of connections across parallel channels in our economy. Um, and so what they do is they create connections among non-competing peer firms or individuals, and um, not just, and then bridges we're talking about. And, and these bridges are actually not just sort of oftentimes, not just single um, links, but actually collectivities. So in this case, what we studied was um, consultancies and trade associations that would put together small groups of quite intimate and bounded, highly bounded um, groups that were meant to, um, were attractive to their members um, for their ability to stimulate um, learning and to push each other to higher performance. Very, very interesting institution, we thought. And part of what they're interesting is what they teach us about larger um, institutions they have around our economy um, and how they support different kinds of, of markets. Um, some of those markets are actually quite limited in doing the things we actually think markets are very good at doing, um, learning and motivating. Um, and in particular, there are a lot of markets out there that are very opaque, not so transparent. It's hard to see or infer what peers are up, um, your peers are up to and learn from them. And actually, even though when you're sort of up against it and you're threatened with, and your, your firm is threatened with their survival, that's very motivating. That's a different kind of motivation than you might get from peers. Um, under, say, in some sense of healthy social pressure, you can get sort of pushing each other to higher performance. That's what I'm talking about. Um, in that case, it's maybe collective collectivities for intelligence, individual intelligence, rather than uh, an intelligence that's embedded in the collectivity, uh, per se. Um, 
this interest that I've started to develop around um, less about networks so much as about institutions and organizations is reflected in the next set of, of pieces of research that I'll sort of summarize. An abiding interest of mine, and why is it that markets are actually much less intelligent than we might think and actually um, misvalue things quite often. So, um, and in particular interest of mine has been over the years has been in why it is that um, assets, firms, individuals that don't fit neatly into the categories that organize valuation suffer a discount or um, are traded sort of uh, inefficiently. Um, and but more generally, you can think about you know classic inefficiencies. Here's an example um, from the Nasdaq bubble, the tech bubble um, from the late '90s. Um, and so, what's going on? And so, two general lessons that um, I've been interested in and that I've taken out and built on other uh, work, uh, certainly that I learned since um, uh, when I was uh, a young network analyst. So one, I think really, really important paradox. Um, if you're trying to understand valuation in financial markets, asset markets, you have to recognize this paradox that kind of like authoritarian regimes, which in the first instance are like the opposites in the sense that um, markets have free choice. You can connect to anybody. You can build whatever bridge you want. Uh, versus authoritarian regimes in which you are restricted. Both settings, though, are marked by a suppression of negative views, of dissent, and that distorts valuations. A classic paper on this is by Edward, Edward Miller, 1977, Journal of Finance. Um, and all he said was basically, let's assume there's, there's um, a spread of opinion um, that people don't converge on the same valuation, pretty reasonable. Um, quite at odds with what was then the dominant view, the orthodox uh, efficient markets approach. Um, and what he showed was actually the more there's heterogeneity opinion, if you assume that it's difficult to express a negative view, then you take all those negative views, it's the heterogeneity that will actually drive price. Now, why did he say that, that it was difficult to express a negative view? Well, it turns out that's actually quite general, as I mentioned. Um, and there's a really important asymmetry in markets. So if prices are too low, in your view, if you think prices are very low relative to the intrinsic value of an asset, there's something you can always do, and that doesn't require any social risk. Um, and so if you're, say, if you're, say, Warren Buffett in particular, what you do is you buy the company, take it off the market, and you earn uh, the income from that company. And if you're right, no problem. You know, you basically, you've now bought an asset on the cheap. If prices are too high, though, in your estimation, there's the, what you can do is very limited. Um, but Buffett never takes those kinds of positions. What you can do is you can express a short position. But short positions are very risky. And actually, a lot of times, you can't even express a short position. Uh, this is the basis for the, uh, a key ingredient in the, um, uh, the, the real estate bubble of the late aughts, uh, or the, of, the, of the aughts, was the fact that you couldn't short real estate. Interestingly, Miller's paper himself, Miller's pa paper um, basically got relatively good attention for about uh, 20 years until it finally started to take off, um, actually around the time of the tech bubble, when people are very interested because short sale constraints were a big part of that story. Um, that, which, so the paper itself reflects um, essentially li uh, limitations in the efficiency of the market for science, something that I've also been quite, been quite interested in published recent paper with Pierre Azulaya. This um, the second point I want to make has to do with um, coordination more generally. So um, it's true on the negative side if you're trying to express a negative view, but it's also true on the positive side to the extent that in order to realize a return in markets or in any setting, to the extent that that depends on what other people's valuations is, you've got a coordination problem on your hands. You've got to somehow anticipate and somehow coordinate with others to get to, um, to, to, to ensure that the valuation is going to be the right evaluation. And this is very, very hard. I and mean, that's another reason why it takes a while for markets to turn through wrong theories. That's uh, this internet stock paper, um, wrong ideas about liquidity. And it can be that actually people will go along with the wrong valuation for quite a while. They'll dance um, for, for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> uh, the larger problem here, and I've worked on this um, relate, with, uh, in a bunch of domains, is how to shift valuations 
off in some sense a misvaluation when, um, and it's very, very hard when it's a coordination problem. I've done some work on status hierarchies where this is really important. Um, one of the reasons why there's, that, why there's status advantages um, for high status um, actors or individuals and institutions is not so much because they're actually perceived as being higher quality, it's because everybody knows that everybody knows that it is common knowledge to coordinate with respect to these um, the status, and that then becomes hard to shift. Same is true for categorizations. The category schemes have this feature as well. And in both cases, um, it can often be the case as well, it's not so much just what everybody knows that everybody knows, it's what everybody wants to know that everybody wants to know. That is, people are committed to those category schemes, and that makes it hard to shift as well. So again, you get misvaluations. I want to come back to that Twitter thread, um, and I'll finish with that. Um, and say another word. So that Twitter thread was about openings for change and why it is that actually, because of this logic, uh, uh, change can actually happen very rapidly. And so there's actually some interesting convergence here across different lines of work in the social sciences. Nothing, you know, hard to, to think of literatures that seem very more different than works on, uh, than literature on bubbles and crashes, financial markets, and then literature on um, scandal. But Arya Dutz's very important work on scandal um, uh, you know, shows something very similar to the work on, on bubbles, which is there can be a lot of knowledge that's out in the system, in this case about social deviance, um, knowing that there's been deviance or someone is uh, someone who's broken, broken in social norms, um, without, but, but it, things don't change until there's a public signal that shows that now everybody knows that everyone knows that it's true. And then since everybody kind of knew it already anyway, it's easy to switch to um, the new valuation it happens very rapidly in a scandal. Uh, so scandal is about disruptive pub publicity, about the publicity of things that actually people maybe already knew. Um, I think something similar was going on in that shift that I talked about earlier. So when Jim Clyburn embraced Joe Biden, um, and then the next day, I think it was the South Carolina primary, um, what you saw was this really wholesale shift and I think what was going on essentially was that everybody was looking for who was going to be the safe choice, essentially. Um, who was going to be the standard bearer for the people who were not um, for Bernie, but who could, could oppose Trump. And that sent a public signal, those, the Clyburn in South Carolina, that, okay, Biden is fine. We'll go with him. And everybody knew that everybody knew that, that, that they were saying that, that and everybody should. Last thing I want to say, some work that I've done, um, I think that, so in thinking about how change happens and how effective coordination can happen, um, I've, done a lot, I've done some work, and in this case with Bob Freeland, um, and I want to highlight the work of Catherine Turco as well, in thinking about how it is that formal organizations um, can um, be as effective as they can when they, when they are, and a key ingredient is their ability to shape common knowledge, and therefore to facilitate coordination, uh, and um, the, the hierarchy of the firm, and particularly the voice rights that are at the heart of that hierarchy are key to that. You can look at it on the negative side, which is you do have you know, a three-headed uh, CEO, three-headed um, 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 voice at the top. You get a cacophony that leads to confusion. But if you have a single voice and it's used carefully, it can facilitate um, and co coordinate and make it quite a collectively intelligent um, uh, organization in at least some very um, well-known cases, um, and um, um, in some, some of those cases can be quite inspiring. I look forward to um, engaging with all of you in the Q&A. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris, for having me. I'm really happy to be here. This is the second time I've uh, addressed uh, the Collective Intelligence uh, Conference. Uh, First time I was out in Santa Clara. Um, and I first just want to say that I'm, uh, I'm all aboard Tom Malone's bullet train to the future. Um, I would like to attend all future conferences in a, uh, a casual shirt and uh, occasionally uh, repairing out to my backyard to sip some iced coffee while I listen to the speakers. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, like Ezra, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am and, and why I'm here. Uh, so the first thing I guess I'd say is, is I'm, I'm a journalist and I'm only an academic by accident, uh, more or less, uh, which means that I have different cognitive strengths than a lot of you, uh, as well as some uh, weaknesses. Uh, 
and uh, I am really good at synthesis. Um, and, uh, and, and that's kind of why I'm here. Our, our, an accident of synthesis is what, uh, you know, uh, has sort of shaped my life for the last 15 years. Uh, I spent most of my professional career at Wired Magazine, uh, and uh, I became really good at looking at forests. Um, but if you dropped me in front of an actual tree, I couldn't tell you if it was a maple or an oak. Uh, so spending that time looking at forests around 2004, 2005, uh, it became really evident that uh, in sort of the broad world of what was going on in the internet, uh, that collective action was beginning to get coordinated uh, and that people were beginning to create, usually for free, uh, you, know, for, you know, gratis, uh, uh, it, they were producing economic value that pro, uh, previously been the province of experts. Um, and from time to time, the popular press uh, would write about this, um, but you know, it was always sort of, you know, again, you have to go way back to the early days of the internet. You're talking 2004, 2005. Um, it was always in the realm of, you know, look, uh, uh, silly pet videos are the wave of the future. Uh, you know, they'll replace TV, which of course we know isn't true. Um, and it's, it struck me that uh, what people were missing out on in paying attention to a surface phenomenon like portrayed here, a geyser, um, was something much larger and tectonic. Um, I needed a name for that tectonic thing, uh, and that name became crowdsourcing. Um, the joke about crowdsourcing is that it was, in fact, a joke. What is that? Oh. Um, I, I was uh, brainstorming with my editor uh, uh, about this phenomenon. Really, we're looking at Wikipedia and a couple other examples. I mean, I mean there wasn't a lot of concrete uh, examples of collective intelligence uh, at, at that time. Um, and he said, it's like outsourcing to this crowd. And I said, or crowdsourcing. And I was trying to make fun of, uh, you know, the left coast penchant for smushing perfectly good English words together and robbing them of, of proper uh, capitalism punctuation. Um, but my editor said, no, this is really good. And, and he forced me to uh, continue using this phrase uh, in the eventual article, which came out uh, in uh, June of 2006. And it was the first time crowdsourcing was used in print. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a really happy accident from my perspective. Uh, this was something that uh, was a lot of fun to cover. It was really exciting. There was a lot happening really quickly. Um, this was a screenshot taken uh, in the first, it was two weeks before the article came out. And, and even these hits are from people who worked at Wired or people who slept with people who worked at Wired. Um, and this was a couple weeks later. I would have never saved these. Someone in the ad department at Wired did screenshots for me. <laughs> I've been thankful for them ever since. Um, you know, my initial perception of crowdsourcing, looking back uh, from the perspective of 15 years, uh, was, I, I think, very hopeful um, and definitely pretty naive. Uh, and, and also, at that time, pretty simplistic. I mean, we didn't, again, I mean, the, the, the examples I had to use uh, for that article uh, were, were few and far between. I mean, when, when we think about the number of people that have come online or have, say, accessed broadband in the, in the last 15 years, uh, it's profound. If we think about the applications that have been built on top of the basic protocols since that time, uh, you know, the change has obviously uh, been profound. Um, so I spent the next couple of years uh, working on a book um, that ultimately led to uh, a year at Harvard and relocating from New York to Boston, uh, and eventually, uh, actually the next year, uh, to my current post uh, teaching journalism at Northeastern. Um, uh, it's been a lot of fun, uh, and I've learned a lot along the way. I, I will say that like any journalist, I've since moved on and I've written about sundry other topics, although uh, broadly staying within technology and culture. Uh, as I do so, um, uh, but really just recently, and mainly through uh, uh, Chris Riddle's uh, kind invitation uh, uh, to uh, address the, the conference again, uh, I've, I've come back to sort of examine uh, the landscape, see, see what I, I make of this 
changed forest uh, in a time of unprecedented crisis. By forest, the metaphor means collective intelligence again. Um, so uh, first, I want to say, ha having spent a few months uh, looking at, at, at you know, wh what the crowd has produced and what it's failed to produce uh, in, in a time of crisis, um, that I, I really agree with, with Tom Malone. I mean, I, I, uh, in fact, I've been uh, bugging some editors to write something uh, you know, with very much the same premise that, uh, you know, that I don't think there's any question that the pandemic is accelerating certain structural changes uh, that were already happening both in the economy and the society at large. Uh, you know, this will undoubtedly have positive and negative effects. Change always does. Um, but from the perspective of collective intelligence and crowdsourcing, I, I think and I hope that it's going to be a net positive and that will bring um, an even larger labor pool to the table, uh, both because the current crisis uh, presents a lot of philanthropic motivation. I mean, as you've already been hearing today, and as was certainly a theme in my book, which is at this point is long in the tooth, it's eight, nine years old, um, incentive and motivation have always been, uh, you know, one of the major, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, bugbears of, of, of crowdsourcing applications. Um, you know, when is finance, well, you know, when do you need money? When is money, in fact, uh, uh, offensive uh, to people and you should be relying on a gift economy? Um, you know, these sort of questions uh, will, uh, you know, continue to, uh, 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 you know, be, be at the fore. Um, but what I will say uh, is that in terms of philanthropic motivation, which has always been a, a, a prime element of a lot of, of collective intelligence examples, uh, you know, no better time than now, right? I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's obviously uh, waxed strongly uh, in a time of, of a pandemic. Um, and then, uh, you know, the other factor that I think should contribute to a rapid development of collective intelligence uh, best practices uh, is, is simply that, that this larger labor pool we have access to uh, now has chunkable uh, uh, labor, uh, you know, because they are at home, because they are working up remotely. Uh, you know, the remote workforce was always, has always been, uh, you know, the mainstay of, a, of, of the crowd, of a crowdsourced labor pool, uh, in that they have, uh, they're able to, to uh, you know, quickly respond to an online query and devote 15 minutes to some mechanical Turk task. Um, uh, you know, I think for the large part, these have been people working from home and the number of people working from home has now grown, uh, you know, by quite a bit. Um, I think when I first started writing about crowdsourcing, I felt as if I tapped some hidden vein, um, almost like a new law within the natural order. Uh, you know, and you can really see this sort of po almost Pollyanna-ish sense of optimism uh, in both in that uh, original article for Wired and in uh, uh, the subsequent book, which at this point has been on your screen for a long time now. Um, I'm honestly not trying to, I would rather promote my last book, so I'm not trying to sell books. I just, it's the slide we're stuck on, folks. Um, um, and before I uh, problematize that idea and undermine all that naive and hopeful optimism, uh, you know, which to br in brief is that crowdsourcing was going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, activate all of this latent knowledge and talent that was being uh, oppressed by uh, lack of development, uh, uh, lack of democratic society norms, uh, governing systems, um, that uh, you know, it would be a leapfrog technology that would reach in and activate all this genius and that we would cure cancer by 2010. I never predicted that, but, you know, that was very much the spirit. Um, you know, before I problematize that, I want to defend it. Uh, I, I want to say that despite the fact that technology, mainly via social media, has wound up, oh, you know, uh, threatening our democracy and world peace and all of that, um, I remain convinced that bringing the world into communication with itself, uh, with each other, uh, and, and, you know, as the next billion uh, continues to come online, uh, will unleash exponentially more talent and intelligence than we've ever known. Um, I, you know, I, I, I recognize as, uh, as, uh, uh, one of our speakers this morning, though, that, uh, you know, that gaming the system is, is be basically become feature more than bug. 
Uh, and I think that that is yet one more challenge that uh, uh, crowdsourcing, collective intelligence, um, all, you know, all new forms of, of, of social economic practice, uh, you know, uh, will simply have to overcome. Uh, it's not one I foresaw, um, but uh, it's, it's one that is certainly, uh, you know, sort of on the front burner uh, right now. Um, I still uh, and, uh, remain faithful that crowdsourcing collective intelligence will eventually lead to immense progress in some of our thorniest problems, uh, which brings us back to one of the very thorniest of all, um, a worldwide uh, pandemic. Um, I think that, uh, I guess one thing I, I wanna say quickly before, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to get into an op-ed that I wrote sort of as a response um, uh, to actually some conversations with, with, with Tom Malone, one of his collaborators, David Sun Kong, um, but also very much Chris, uh, is that, um, and it's just uh, sort of another accident, that I've, I've been spending the last couple of years for my, for my third book uh, pretty steeped in evolutionary uh, biology um, and evolutionary anthropology uh, and thinking a lot about human history. And I, I, I just want to say that when you're looking at the fact that something that is, uh, you know, uh, you know, as, as Tom, in fact, pointed out, we can't say collective intelligence is 15, 20 years old. Uh, in fact, we have to say that it is many millennia old. But we can say that it has uh, experienced uh, both a great accelerated development in that time, uh, primarily because of things like Moore's Law uh, and the Internet. Um, and uh, we can also say uh, that it has come to the attention of us in a way that it simply didn't before. Uh, it's a, a lot of the people in this community will be familiar with things like say the Longitude Prize. It's not like the London Times and the Tatler and all the London papers uh, back in the 17 teens suddenly started writing about collective intelligence. Um, that has been a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, there's something about spending most of your days thinking about mankind uh, not as a species uh, that has existed since the invention of, 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 of written language, but as, some, as a species that is hundreds of thousands of years old, we think now 300,000 years old, and it's uh, more or less anatomically modern form, uh, that the fact that something that has taken 15 years uh, to overcome uh, some challenges is not surprising. Uh, in fact, it's to be expected, even in our age of accelerated change. Uh, uh, the one thing that I'll, I'll sort of end on, and then I want to get into sort of you know my report from uh, uh, the you know the uh, you know crowdsourcing and COVID, uh, is uh, that you know I'm I'm a, as, as I grow older, as I do more research, as I write more books, as I spend more time looking at lots of forests. Um, again, very committed to looking broadly, uh, as, as journalists are supposed to do at, at social trends, at social phenomena, um, is that change coming and punctuated in the, in the form of punctuated equilibrium, as we know that as, as evolution itself does, as natural selection works, you know, where, 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 uh, long periods of stasis followed by explosive periods of change, uh, you know, we see that pattern repeated across the social sciences, um, across human endeavor. So, I, you know, I don't think it's uh, we should be surprised or that we should be uh, deemed uh, overly optimistic to expect that this horrible crisis will also produce bene you know, benefits uh, and productive change. Um, that said, uh, and I'm going to leap in here with, with some problems I feel I've seen, um, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, I think that that uh, the pandemic has, and maybe this is part of that progress, uh, has has really helped identify, uh, y you know, you know the wrinkles in w which we still need to iron out. Uh, okay, so I'm going to uh, present my paper. Uh, so, crowds. It's and and I should say this is an op-ed that's pre-publication. Um, Crowdsourcing should be a phenomenon that has met its moment. Millions of bright, talented people are suddenly endowed with hours of leisure and a strong incentive to use them for the good of humanity. Many organizations have made an attempt to harness our collective intelligence to help solve the immense problems we now face. NASA has issued a call for ideas across the agency. Harvard Medical School has crowdsourced a COVID map. Let's go and let me, it's, it's an op-ed with slides. Is that for new media? 
for a while. Let's skip ahead. Um, Harvard Medical School has crowdsourced a COVID map, uh, which you know I, I want to dwell on just a little bit to point out has has oh, um, has been a uh, uh, it, you know one thing that crowdsource has been uh, it, you know has continued in this crisis to be excellent at, which is simple data collection. Um, everyone from the University of Minnesota, your local garage inventor, are trying to hack together open source ventilators. But so far, the kind of breakthrough we've been primed to expect from the internet's much heralded hive mind has failed to emerge. I'm not surprised. I coined the term uh, in a Wired magazine, we just talked about that. Uh, strangers coming together to do someone else's job, usually for little or no financial reward. Uh, the truth is that uh, in its history, crowdsourcing has produced a few successes and plenty of flops, uh, but it maintains its appeal for the simple reason uh, that when it works, it can produce things that are profound and meaningful. Uh, what countless startups and not a few large companies have learned, though, is that the crowd is a finicky beast, uh, and all the right elements need to be in place to make it work. Uh, right now, the crowd is more cacophony than choir, but used correctly, it might just help us develop a vaccine in record time or create an effective system of contact tracing. I, I'm going to put my money on the latter before I put it on the former, uh, for reasons I'll, I'll mention briefly. Uh, but through 15 years of trial and error, there are a few principles that we need to put in place if we are to tap our collective brilliance and goodwill. Uh, first, the problem needs to be well-defined. How do we hack a ventilator is not a question. It's a thousand interrelated questions. When it became clear that we were facing a critical shortage of ventilators, tinkerers around the world leapt to the challenge. Um, but I thought it was really interesting that, uh, you know, the 3D printing, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the father of 3D printing, the, you know, Neil Gershenfeld, uh, at MIT, um, actually had asked for manufacturers to provide detailed specs uh, before sort of activating his network of garage fabricators. Um, next, uh, you know, and this has been a theme this morning, uh, today, uh, is that sometimes you need a crowd of experts. Uh, and I'll emphasize sometimes because I think, uh, you know, Aline's uh, points uh, were really uh, uh, well made. That uh, That's not to de-emphasize the role that citizens or, or that uh, all of us play. Um, crowdsourcing is the proven tool for coming up with innovative ideas. We're no longer asking people to come up with a more creative way to sell Doritos. I'm sure you've all watched the crowdsourced Doritos ads. Uh, COVID has presented us with hard technical problems uh, uh, and that we can also come up with incredibly innovative ideas, but to implement them, we need experts with immense technical knowledge. Um, finally, and I'm going to skip ahead again because I know I'm out of time. I just, I like this for, you know, d defining problem. Uh, one of the brilliant things about uh, COVID near you, which is, again, that's Harvard Medical School's data crowd, you know, crowd data collection effort, uh, has simply just been the UI, the design. Uh, you know, what is the problem is, is, is simply, uh, how are you as an individual feeling uh, uh, the solution is to aggregate the answer to that question? Um, uh, you know, another successful uh, example from the last couple months, uh, is an oncology, and again, um, you know, it's centered around data collection. And where I want to land, and where I'm really interested in my final All right, so this is taken right from uh, uh, Tom's uh, uh, collab, the pandemic collab, um, which I'm really excited about and really excited to participate in. Um, and and I think Tom hit the nail on the head uh, when when he said that you know the, uh, I, uh, you know I'll speak for myself. But I think the best thing uh, that, that 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 the effort from CCI can do is is this recruitment of people and resources uh, to implement selected solutions. Um, and the final point, in my little op-ed here. Finally, for crowdsourcing to be truly effective, we'll need to adjust uh, some of our existing norms and conventions. Uh, one of the most promising applications of crowdsourcing involves following Asia's lead and using our phones to help us with contact tracing. Uh, to implement such an operation, Americans are going to have to adjust their expectation for personal privacy. For their part, corporations and academic institutions are going to need to loosen their grip over existing intellectual property and be willing to share the ideas that are sure to emerge from any collaboration of scientists and other creators. Uh, so those are some some interim thoughts. I'll em em emphasize that you know these are early days, uh, regardless of what our administration would have you believe, uh, and uh, uh, and, and 
you know, uh, provisional observations. But uh, it's an exciting time, and, and hopefully it will ultimately be looked back at as, as a very positive time for all of us, but also for the field of collective intelligence. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I'm delighted to participate in this collective intelligence uh, event, and uh, I would say, um, like Ezra Zuckerman mentioned earlier, you know, I, I was trained as a sociologist, but I, I'm, I'm coming to, to see myself as a collective intelligence researcher last um, summer at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I was invited to, to, to speak at this group, and I, I realized that, that this, is, this is the group. This, 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 is, this may be my, my tribe, my new tribe. So I want to talk to, I, I, and I, I would say, I think of myself probably uh, less of a collective intelligence researcher and more of a collective ignorance researcher. And so um, and I think that provides pathways to, to collective intelligence. So I'm going to talk about designing diversity uh, for collective uh, advance and how to think about principles that might allow us to, to, to do that. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a social uh, sociologist and computational uh, social scientist. I'm um, uh, a, uh, let's see, I'm having a hard time advancing my slides here. Um, ah, here we go. Uh, I, I run a computational social science uh, program at the University of Chicago and a center called Knowledge Lab, which is really focused on uh, using large scale data, machine learning, and intelligent uh, crowdsourcing, following uh, Jeff Howe's lead to enable us to kind of represent, understand which is to say do kind of a large scale science studies and transform um, how it is that we generate new knowledge. And, and the underlying question is how does science and discovery as a system think and, and how can we rewire it to, to think better, uh, to do the various things that it might claim that it wants to do uh, better. And so I've been trying to ferment some of these discussions um, at places like science of the last couple of years where we've focused on building up the community of the science of science. A lot of it has to do there with really uh, diagnosing collective intelligence and identifying how it is that we could identify uh, opportunities for uh, collective advance. So I'm going to share um, a few recent research insights and some musings in the context of three kind of empirical chapters. One is how diverse and disconnected communities generate more robust uh, scientific insights, how novel collective inference um, gets driven by cross-disciplinary expeditions by people who are diverse as a function of their uh, their disciplinary and perspectival backgrounds, and then how designing dis diversity can accelerate not only um, discoveries that might have already been on the future, um, but to also chart an inhuman future, which is to say to identify discoveries that would not have been uh, made otherwise. And so, um, I uh, underlying this is, is a view of, of science and innovation and technological development as a complex system which uh, uh, kind of underlies the fact that uh, humans um, act often as pack animals uh, such that they create dense social connections that can distort collective certainty and, and slow uh, novel discovery and, and, and invention. Um, so uh, a couple of simple demonstrations of this is if you look at the social structure of agreement or disagreement in uh, peer review, uh, recently we looked at this in the context of class one, uh, these are reviews in the neuroscience space and we found that they were highly clustered epistemologies, which is to say if you were connected to um, an author or to the, the author of an author, or the co-author of the co-author of the co-author, however close that connection was predicted the likelihood that you would accept versus reject uh, the, the, the piece that uh, you were reviewing. And, um, and again, this was further than just uh, tit for tat and you doing them a favor and them doing you a favor. These were sometimes two or three or four connections uh, away from yourself. There's, there's no obvious way in which you could uh, anticipate a benefit to yourself. And yet, nevertheless, you found their work accurate enough to not reject it from class one who's only extensive a sensible criteria for uh, evaluation is accuracy and not the significance of a finding. Um, related to this is more recent work that we've done uh, to identify how centralized communities generate less replicable, rep replicable results in the context of what many have called the replication crisis. And the social and behavioral sciences, also in genetics and medicine, um, initially we looked at this in drug gene interactions where we took 
um, basically findings from the literature and we lined them up with high throughput results from a massively replicated kind of robotically driven lab experiment on drug gene interactions. And um, on the one hand, we found that there was collective correction in science where there were a ton of people publishing about things. It was more likely that one was uh, to find uh, deep replication in the context of a high throughput experiment. And similarly, uh, in converse, when there was uh, disagreement over the conditions in which uh, a drug might be efficacious for a disease-related gene, you also found disagreement in the literature, right? So there was kind of an alignment between the high throughput experiment and between what it is that scientists and the community were actually doing. But when there was a high level of centralization uh, in science, uh, scientists in the community, um, and when there was a high level of dependence or overlap, for example, between authors on uh, the papers that were contributing to that particular drug gene related claim, or they were using the same methods, or they were citing the same prior work and having the same orientation that was leading them to anticipate the same findings, um, that they were much more likely to agree with themselves over time, uh, that all those things were like a methodological or, or or a kind of epistemological bubble. You know, so the same co-authors use the same methods, rely on the same prior literature, and that this is associated with less replicable findings in the context of massively replicated uh, high throughput experiments, which is to say, um, you know, individuals, if they're all tied together using all the same methods with all the same expectations, are performing the same precise experiment over and over and over again, which is very unlikely to generalize outside their labs, into the clinic, into medicine, uh, into areas that are beyond their particular area. Um, whereas uh, findings which are distributed across the community um, have diverse authors, diverse methods, draw on diverse background knowledge, uh, end up doing uh, precisely uh, the opposite. Um, and we find the same thing in recent work on clinical trials. Um, this is associated with um, uh, as fields grow in science, there's a, a shrinkage uh, in the amount of prior work uh, that is drawn upon. And that shrinkage in the prior work increases uh, not only the actual advances, but the illusion of advances. Um, finally, we see um, that flocking uh, ends up slowing the advance towards future understanding because individuals are less likely to span out across the space of possible uh, discoveries. And uh, in most recent work on this, on this kind of first chapter of insight, we found that uh, when we looked at gene-gene interactions, uh, uh, you know, publications versus uh, high throughput experiments, um, we can basically take these biases and use them to generate greater certainty. So for example, we can take um, the uh, dependence between communities and we can use those dependencies to generate predictions. These are AUCs uh, just based on um, the insularity of the communities uh, that allows us to make better overall assessments, kind of Bayesian updates of the literature in general. And, and when, we, when we take this into account, uh, we find, for example, massive increases in our ability to predict the robustness of the finding as a result of the number of distinct communities uh, and our ability to kind of span out across the space of, of possible things uh, examined. Um, in general, this suggests that these connected communities uh, end up weakening uh, the results and generalization of those communities. Um, so chapter two uh, in this exploration is, uh, you know, that robust facts are established across clusters, as we just talked about, but novel discoveries actually occur across fields, right? So this goes back to um, a broader question that I began with, how does science as a collective think? Well, do they think by deducing from existing known kind of facts or commitments or axioms to the future, like Aristotle would propose, or like Francis Bacon would suggest, by induction, by imaginably generalizing from observations? Well, in collectivities, we do both of those things. Uh, and in fact, um, Charles Sanders Peirce argued that almost every recent advance in science, technology, and business is the result of the creative production of hypotheses based on the collision of induction and deduction. So the, the creation of uh, new uh, surprising 
for new hypotheses is a function of surprising or theory-defying evidence. Um, and we find um, strong evidence for this in uh, our own investigations of the, the scientific and, and technological space. So when we look at, at, uh, at, at papers in biomedicine and physics uh, and even inventions, uh, and we build a model, we build a kind of a manifold that, uh, that draws together the things that are the most likely to come together in the context of a current discovery. And, uh, and when we do this across um, across all fields and try to predict all of next year's papers, we're able to predict about 98% of, of the, of basically the, the collections of, of keywords, you know, the methods, the problems that are combined in the context of next year's papers. Um, and that's because, you know, researchers are persistent uh, in these spaces. Uh, uh, and it also suggests, uh, what this also suggests are the papers that show up that are unlikely to be expected under this most expected or most predictable model. Uh, and it turns out if we analyze these, um, these unexpected discoveries are highly likely to be associated with major awards. Um, so we're able to predict, uh, you know, almost, you know, uh, you know, 50 to 60 percent of the likelihood of being in the top 10 percent of, of citations as a result of this of this novelty, novel combinations of, of elements in this space uh, in, in biomedicine and physics and, and patents. And, uh, and the thing that's most interesting is when we ask where these come from, do they come from unusual people? No, uh, not an average. Do they come from unusual teams? No. Uh, what they come from is unusual expeditions. So they come from from people with a certain set of expertise to travel over to a new audience, to publish in a journal that's never seen people like them before, and no people like them has published on problems like this before. Um, so it's really, this comes, uh, new discoveries in this space come from, from conversation between established fields and outsiders or aliens. Um, so it's this conversation between insiders who identify familiar puzzles and outsiders that kind of address or solve those problems with, with alien patterns. Um, so the next question uh, I, I pose is how, you know, can we actually use these principles to design diversity that increases collective uh, imagination and accelerates advance? And, uh, and so we uh, tried to do this in the context of a really interesting nature paper from last summer uh, that we didn't write that was written by researchers at Lawrence Livermore Lab in Berkeley, uh, where they used um, artificial intelligence methods to embed and then predict new photovoltaic or thermoelectric materials. Um, and so they were able to develop predictions that had a 40% precision hit rate, where uh, they were able to predict new materials, the next 20, 40%, of the, the next 20 years of, of materials that were discovered with those particular properties. Um, and so, uh, we thought, well, can we take, can we, can we do better by understanding what the field itself is likely to discover? And so we built uh, random walks over this space. We did a precise replication of their work. Uh, and, then we, um, and then we built random walks over the space that, that, that jumped not only from chemical to chemical, but also through authors. So, so our, our, our random walks were able to, to identify um, social communities, and, and those random walks are very unlikely to jump across a boundary between those communities because there's no person sitting at the boundary of those communities to make an inference. If we do that, then um, we're able to double those predictions. So we jump from a, a 40% uh, you know, precision in predicting uh, new materials over the next 20 years to, to an 85% prediction in and predicting new materials that will have thermoelectric properties, ferroelectric properties, over 90% prediction in, uh, in predicting uh, things that would have uh, photovoltaic properties. Um, and what's the most interesting is that um, we can capture the most expected discoveries uh, and the most unexpected discoveries. So the ones uh, that are random walks in this space uh, identify that are the most likely uh, to be inferred by actual people are the ones that are discovered in the first few years. And then we're able to identify things that will 
uh, be very unlikely to be discovered by the scientific system as it currently stands uh, with educations the way they are and boundaries between fields. Uh, in fact, we're able to further predict the discovering teams, who are the actual people who are likely to cross the boundaries and make particular discoveries and use those to catalyze uh, implausible discoveries by suggesting teams that would be likely to uh, identify new things. Um, we've been pointing this recently to drug gene uh, vaccine prediction, um, where we found that um, the uh, vaccines which are currently under, um, under clinical trial review are those that would be most expected by the scientific system uh, to be considered at this time. Uh, but, uh, but the ones that haven't been considered that are equally promising, uh, the reason they haven't been considered is because basically the scientific system is structured in a certain way. And if we, if we identify and catalyze um, diversity by focusing attention on certain places where no persons currently exist, then we could really uh, explore new parts of the space which would be critical for public health. So um, just in conclusion, um, I'm proposing that we can really think about designing diversity to catalyze advance. Uh, the discovery is fundamentally a high dimensional phenomenon that requires social, institutional, and methodological disconnection and diversity. That novel combinations of people, techniques, and problems uh, uh, advance the space, and that designing optimal diversity can catalyze future advance that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. Uh, moreover, it suggests that to generate robust uh, insight, and rapidly advanced technology and science, uh, that we can actually de design diverse intelligences by adding artificial intelligences um, that don't think the way in which the human crowd has trained them. Uh, and so it really actually, I think, proposes a new way of thinking, uh, a collective intelligence way of thinking about um, AIs, you know, a new artificial intelligence that augments uh, human intelligence by, uh, by actually uh, being complementary to it, by being very different from it. Uh, and so uh, I'll close uh, with that and just a mention of, of my collaborators on these various projects. Um, and with that, I'll end. Thank you. Um, we are a little bit over time, but I would like to have a very brief Q&A and at least um, have like one question for each of you. Um, and um, Helene, you're still here, I assume. Um, so we had a question for Helene. Yes, I, I am here. Great. Should I? And, um, so the question is, um, when you facilitated these interactions between um, citizens and, uh, and and kind of the experts or politicians, um, were th was there a role reversal that some citizens got recognized as experts? Uh, yes, they were recognized as experts. There was, for example, in the group housing that I was. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there were, in the, in the housing group that I was in, that turned out to be an architect. So clearly he had some very, uh, you know, complex ideas about uh, limiting urban sprawl, about uh, architectural design, about biosourced materials. So he was performing the, the he, he was acting like an expert and educating the other citizens, but, um, but, uh, you know, he was not the only source of expertise. There was, for example, another um, citizen in the same group that used to be a, a city mayor. So he came in with the expertise of, of a certain kind of politics, electoral politics. Uh, so in a way, everyone brought their own, you know, stone to, to, the, to the heap and, and contributed. So, so I, I didn't mean to pit experts against citizens as if, you know, only the, 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 the experts knew something and the citizens never did, but it's just in terms of how, do, how were they selected at the gate? Were they selected on the, on the basis of their knowledge or just on the basis that they were citizens? So that's the distinction I draw, but yes, there were experts in, in the group of citizens, of course. You know, it, France is a very educated population. There were a lot of professionals. Right. So. Um. And uh, so it just keeps getting voted higher here. So I'll, I'll 
ask this one. Um, it's, it's for you again, Helene. Um, when you facilitate these interactions between citizens and, and experts, like how can experts, do you have any thoughts on how experts can communicate uncertainty with citizens? Like especially say in the COVID case right now where um, a lot of scientific knowledge just is uncertain. You don't know how things are going to work out. And so how can you communicate uncertainty? Uh, well, in the case of climate change, there were, you know, uh, uncertainties as well. Um, they, I think that's a good question. I, I'd, I'd have to go back to my notes. I, I feel like um, the experts communicated a lot of certainty, actually. Um, uh, but they were able to say, well, you know, sometimes, for example, the, the, their task was to um, give a grade to the to the performance of certain measures in terms of carbon reduction. So that it was like a very simple grade. It was a one to three, right? How, how is that going to perform comparatively to other proposals? And I, I have no idea where they, they, they got the certainty that this deserved a one versus a three, but they, they gave a range of, of uh, you know, uh, performances and, and citizens to, to keep at face value, I think. and. Yeah, it's a very good question. I, I, I don't really have an answer already off the top of my head. I'd have to go back. Um, what struck me is that there was not much disagreement among the experts in terms of the, the uh, horizon, you know, for climate change and the dangers associated with it. And so th there was a sort of like massive consensus about that from the beginning. Right. Thanks, Elaine. Um, and a question for James. Um, you, um, like you just close in the end of your talk, you uh, started to hint at some research, new research you're doing, looking at COVID-19 related work. And did you, did you look at, or did you see any changes in diversity of people engaged in that research right now? Yeah, I mean, there's a massive increase in the diversity of, of uh, participants uh, engaging in, in, in COVID. Um, at the same time, it's tricky because that's confounded with the fact that almost everybody is part of uh, a single um, overlapping global conversation about COVID. So that's actually decreased some of the diversity of the signals uh, of, of uh, you know, so often some of the diversity, the benefits of diversity emerge from conversations that, that take place uh, separately. And so, even though you have electrical engineers coming and basically doing epidemiological work and you know so people coming from from really diverse places and bringing new tools and so th there really is a benefit of diversity to that uh there that diversity is constrained because everybody is trying to really actively fit it into a singular narrative that can drive policy right now and so that singular narrative is actually driving down some of the the, the benefits that one might otherwise have expected uh, to see from the vast diversity of, of participants that are engaged in this work. Right. Well, and like I imagine interactions right now are, are more difficult, right? So even if you bring new people in, it's harder to have conversations with them potentially. That's right. But everybody's looking at that last science or nature paper. Uh, there's a lot more light is shown on the center, you know, of kind of the hierarchy of, of knowledge distribution. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Um